In your opinion, when it comes to mitochondria, what's the best diet to support them? Yeah, I would say a seasonal diet that's local to your area is the best bet because when you eat foods that were grown in your environment, you're yoking your biology to your environment, which means that you're going to be more adapted to your environment. Um, and so that's also beneficial from like an economic perspective as well and an environmental perspective, because if you're supporting farmers that have good farming practices that are in your area, that means you're supporting these beneficial farming pra practices that are helping to renew the soils and you're supporting, you know, the animals being treated the right way and all these things, but you're also not relying on your food being flown halfway across the world to get to your plate. So you're also directly influencing the market on like, you know, basically uh, the global food supply chain, which is largely, I mean, I would argue is probably one of the biggest sources of pollution in the modern world. Um, we don't need to be eating avocados in the middle of winter in New Jersey. We don't need to be eating bananas and strawberries and all these things that aren't growing in our area. And there's actually a biologic benefit to that as well, because it turns out the deuterium content of seasonal foods also varies depending on the time of year. So, for example, in the summertime, like around now, there's lots of plant foods available that can grow here. And plant foods, by and large, have higher le levels of deuterium, which is the heavy form of hydrogen. And I mentioned earlier the electron transport chain, uh, which is what cre creates um, energy, water, and photons in the mitochondria. But the electron transport chain, and specifically the last complex of the chain, ATP synthase, gets gunked up by deuterium. So mitochondria hate deuterium. It doesn't belong anywhere near them. But when mitochondria become dysfunctional, deuterium can start to leach into that environment and kind of wreak havoc. So the body has some mechanisms to get rid of deuterium, including sweating and including this um, melanin water splitting mechanism. Because what this can do is basically melanin can both split water, but it can also reform it. We have this mechanistically worked out. I think in humans, we still have to prove that this is happening, but it, you know, it makes sense from a first principle standpoint. But the interesting thing about this is that when melanin reforms water, it will only reform water with light hydrogen and not deuterium. So in essence, what's happening is that when melanin reforms water, it's deuterium depleting the water in the body. Um, and this is important because the deuterium water, like deuterium laden water cannot get anywhere near the mitochondria because it starts to gunk up those engines. So if you're eating plant foods um, and it's like around this time of year here in New Jersey, you're okay because the weather's warmer, you're sweating more, there's higher UV content, so you're stimulating that melanin more, your body can handle more deuterium coming in through the diet. The major deuterium-rich foods include roots, fruits, and grains. Uh, the green parts of plants are low in deuterium because chloroplasts, like mitochondria, do not like deuterium. So green parts of plants where the chlorophyll and the chloroplasts are, are low deuterium. Contrast that with diets in the winter, you know, this Play, like this latitude, it, the ground freezes in the winter, which means you can't grow plant foods, which means your diet should primarily consist of animal fats and proteins and seafood, perhaps. And so these foods are highly, in, uh, highly depleted in deuterium. So animal fats and proteins, animal fats in particular are the lowest deuterium food, proteins would be second. And so if you're eating these deuterium depleted foods during the winter time, you're actually supporting your mitochondrial function because in the absence of warm temperatures to facilitate sweating and high levels of UV light to help this deuterium depletion mechanism at the level of the water in the body, your body actually should be taking in less deuterium in order to function optimally in that season. And so it just turns out that eating foods that grow in your area or that were raised in your area are actually supporting your mitochondrial function via this deuterium mechanism as well. And there's actually a whole other mechanism as well relating to like microRNAs and um, other molecules like this that are exosomes and things like this that plants and animals in our environment can use to actually help regulate gene expression in our bodies to yoke our biology to our environments. And so if you're eating local produce that was raised, you know, in a, in a good way, you're actually getting access to information that's also influencing the way your cells express themselves. So it actually goes quite deep. Okay, this wouldn't apply to the information piece you brought up just now. And we're not recommending it, but for somebody that is eating plants up north in the winter, you mentioned sweating and light. Is there any way you could think of to hack that indoors 
and more just to look at the physiology. Again, we're not recommending this because obviously we want to stick as close to nature as we can. And then also bring in deuterium depleted water. I know that's a way to hack it as well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, people can use saunas in the winter. Um, that's something that the Scandinavians figured out a long, long time ago, leveraging sauna and geothermal pools and also um, doing contrast therapy with like ice plunging, going back and forth with that. They figured out that you could leverage sauna and geothermal pools to get access to infrared light when there's barely any available because the days are super short. So that's another way to provide light to your body in the, you know, the absence of light from the sun. Um, but when it comes to, uh, you know, dealing with deuterium from plant-based diets, let's say in the wintertime in high latitudes, you know, leverage sweating, um, you can leverage also deuterium depleted water. The only thing I would say about that is that, um, I guess some of the main companies out there are not telling people they're supposed to dil dilute this water and not drink it straight. Um, all of the research on using deuterium depleted water for cancer patients and type two diabetics, they found that the sweet spot for, for, um, consumption of deuterium depleted water for, uh, creating, um, uh, health outcomes in these patients is between 105 and 120 parts per million. And so if you get like five parts per million deuterium depleted water, what that would look like is a, about a one to four dilution. So you would take one liter of five parts per million and add it into three liters of your regular drinking water to get to around 105 parts per million. And that's the water that you'd want to drink. In the context of cancer and diabetes, they're having patients do this for 12 weeks and this is the only water that they're allowed to drink for that 12 week period, including like if they make tea or coffee or whatever, they're using that water. Um, they're also instructed to eat low deuterium diets during that time. So mostly animal based diets and or like leafy greens. So that would be another way to kind of offset some of the deuterium load coming in from like roots, fruits and grains during the winter time. If you are like hell bent on consuming them at that time. Um, yeah, those would be the main things that I would think of. And of course, if you're using like the, the spurty lamp as well, you're going to be getting some UV light from that. But I think for people who have uncoupled mitochondria, some more Northern mitochondria from mom and you live in a more Northern latitude, leveraging cold is going to be more appropriate for you compared to leveraging something like a spurty. Um, that doesn't mean you can't ever use the spurty, but I would say your body is really expecting to leverage the cold instead. So I would give it that if and when you can, um, versus the people with more coupled mitochondria who have darker skin and live in northern latitudes. Those are the individuals that would really benefit from using a spurty lamp or some form of a UV light device in the wintertime to help their biology cope with being in kind of a hostile environment for what they evolved or were designed to inhabit. Okay, so mitochondria hate deuterium. It breaks them. Early in our conversation, I think you brought up metabolic water that is made by mitochondria. Is there any connection there? Yeah, so the, the water that mitochondria make is deuterium-depleted metabolic water. So you don't need to drink deuterium-depleted water to get access to it. Your body is making a ton of it itself. The key, though, is that it needs to be exposed to near-infrared light all day long in order to do that optimally. We're meant to be bathed in near-infrared photons as long as the sun is up. And so that is what's allowing and stimulating the mitochondria to optimally make energy, water, and photons. Um, and most people are not getting access to that near-infrared light because they're sitting indoors. So adding some of that back into the environment indoors or working outside is going to be your best bet for helping to support the production of deuterium depleted water within your own cells. If you enjoyed that clip, you're going to want to head over here and catch the full episode. I'll see you over there. UV light produces this complex pro-hormone in the body called pro-opiomelanocortin or POMC. POMC is cleaved into 10 different hormonal products, one of which is beta endorphin, which is a natural opioid that the body makes in response to UV.